Welcome to the Fed Life Podcast with Dan Seip from Serving Those Who Serve. In this podcast, Dan draws from years of financial experience to help federal employees overcome challenges that every Fed can relate to. Join us for this journey as we reach, teach, and serve to help you make the right financial decisions. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Fed Life Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Seip. Additionally, I'm the branch manager here at Serving Those Who Serve, Lee Seip and Associates. I will begin, as I always do, by saying thank you. Thank you for taking time to listen. And above all, thank you for your service to the government, to the country, to me, to everyone. You don't hear it enough. You will always hear it here. Ed Zerndorfer is back with us again. Guru is here one more time as part of our ongoing mission to reach, teach, and serve you. Uh, at the outset, I need to say the opinions of our guest, Ed Zerndorfer, are not the opinions of Raymond James or Serving Those Who Serve. This podcast is presented for information only and is not intended to be taken as advice. All listeners should consult their personal advisors for taking any action. Well, folks, we are back with part two of our biggest podcast series to date. I, I really can't stress this enough because it's about the milestones for your Fed life. And I reiterate that every single Fed should read this article at the Fed Zone from Ed and should listen to this podcast and should share it because there are things in here that if you miss them can impact you and if you seize them can impact you in the favorable way so we want you to make sure that you have what you need to get the most out of this and as i mentioned in our last podcast and i'll say it again i'll bet you know some of these and maybe some folks know most of them but i think there's darn few that are going to know all of them, and these can be super important for you getting the most out of your federal benefits. Uh, quick reminder, don't forget, subscribe to the podcast and subscribe to our weekly serving. That's our very best from Ed, Ben Fitzben, Jan Meyer, Wes Battle, whole crew at Serving This Serve, delivered to you each and every week. So Ed, we're jumping back in and we're jumping back in with what I think is one of the big whopper milestones. And to, to, to say it is huge and an understatement, and that's what I like to call the 10% bump. And that is 20 years and age 62. Tell us about that for a first employee. Dan, this is so important. I'm glad you really dressed this thing up because it is <laughs> so important that first employees understand the consequences of retiring at age 62 with a minimum of 20 years of service yep. versus retiring before age 62 with, let's say, 30 years of service at their MRA or 20, we talked about 20 years at age 60 or you know, in the first podcast. This is super, super important. I'm so glad we're doing this right, to, for, right off the bat. All right, here's what it comes down to when it comes to age, a first employee. Uh, who's reached age 62 and has a minimum 20 years of service. And by the way, uh, that 20 years of service does include unused sick leave, which is, of course, in hours, but then it's converted to months and days of service. You can use that, this unused sick leave. Normally, it, it, it's, it's not used. It's not used for eligibility purposes to retire, but it, gotcha. it is used in the computation for the computation um, for the first annuity, and it is used when that unused sick leave in hours is converted to months of day of service for purposes of getting over the 20 year hump. That's enormous. Okay, so I wanted to point that out from the start. Now, what it comes down to is this a first employee who retires before age 62, any number of years of service. We're talking about someone who's not a special provision employee, by the way. We're talking about just a, a you know, a regular first employee. Um, who is not you know, in the special provision category, no matter what age they retire, their first annuity will be computed using what is called the 1.1% 1. 1. 1 accrual factor. For every year of service they have, including unused sick leave, they will get 1% of their high three average salary. 
That's how the FERS annuity is computed. That's the starting FERS annuity. Gotcha. If a FERS employee retires at age 62 or later and has a minimum 20 years of service, then the accrual factor, which is used, is for every year of service the, 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 the retiring employee has at the time of at the employee has at the time of his or her retirement, including unused sick leave converted to months and days of service, the employee gets 1.1% yep. of their high three average salary. That is a 10% bump. Mm -hmm. Now, Dan, when I present this to FERS employees, they say, well, if I retired 62, then I'm not going to be able to get what's called the FERS Special Retirement Supplement Annuity, which we're going to talk about in a few moments here. Oh, the yeah. Fer, the FERS special retirement uh, supplement annuity is in addition to the FERS annuity that a FERS employee who retires before age 62 will get between the time they retire, between sometime between MRA and age 62, they get the special retirement annuity in addition to the FERS annuity. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the downside about the FERS special retirement annuity is that it's temporary. It stops when one becomes age 62. Yep. Whereas with the 1.1%, 1.1% accrual factor, the 10% bump, Dan, it mm. is permanent. Oh, yeah. What I tell employees is this. Please do not end up becoming what I call a Monday morning quarterback. I could have, I should have, but I didn't work until age 62. I missed out on that 10% bump. You don't want Absolutely. to regret, you don't want to regret this finding out, oh, I don't have enough uh, my annuity is not as much as I thought. And that special retirement supplement annuity will be long forgotten in your mind. Sure. Sure. So, you know, and and the other part of this, Ed. And and I know you cover it in uh, in our first webinars, folks. If you haven't attended one, be sure you do. Okay, getting to sixty two, you're gonna have colas too. Once you retire, good point. You know, so there's uh, it, it's it's like it's like all the great holidays are piled on one day for you here, and and folks really don't know about it. So so yes, we're going a little over the top here, folks, but. But Ed and I both believe it's that important. Yes. Okay, so we're at we're at 25 years now, 25 years and any age. And once again, this has to do with Vera and Visa. So talk about that. Yeah, at, if, a, if an employee has a minimum 25 years of service and their agency is offering an early out in the form of a Vera or a VSIP, the employee can retire at any age. Mm -hmm. and start receiving their unreduced annuity. I should say their unreduced FERS annuity. If they're, if they're CSRS or SERS offset, if they're under age 55, their annuity will be reduced, reduced by 2% gotcha. per year for every year they're under age 55. But FERS employees um, do not get that reduction. Now, I got to point out to something very important about this, though, in terms of the TSP. Let's suppose an employee has 25 years of service and they're age 48 and they're, 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 they're gung-ho. They're getting an early out. They're going to receive the fir their FERS annuity, their FERS annuity unreduced. Let's say they have 25 years of service. So they'll get 25% of their high three average salary. But remember we were talking about the TSP a few moments uh, earlier, Dan, about, about, the, um, about when you can start drawing from the traditional TSP? and not mm -hmm. be subject to a 10% early withdrawal penalty. Mm -hmm. Remember we said 50, you have to retire sometime during or after the year you turn 55. Yes. Guess what? You retire at age at, at, at and before age, age 50, the year you turn 55, you can't get to your traditional TSP. You cannot, you cannot receive a penalty free TSP, a traditional TSP. And we talked about a little bit about the special retirement annuity, the special retirement annuity. If you're a FERS employee, you'll have to wait until you're, you reach your MRA to get the special retirement supplement annuity. What I'm sure. saying is 
you're only going to be living off of 20, you know, you know, 25% of your highest average salary. You got to go out and get another job. <laughs> yeah. You can. And, and, and social security, you're, you're talking about minimum, you know, age 62. Uh, I don't know about that. No, I got you. I got you. Um, okay. So now we've got back to back 30 years. Uh, as far as your article is, is concerned. So the first one is 30 years and age 55, and that has to do with CSRs and CSRS office employees. So what do we have here, Ed? Yes, a CSRS or service office employee is able to retire under immediate unreduced retirement if they have a minimum 30 years of service and they have reached their 55th birthday. I got to say, I got to just emphasize something here. When I say they're 55, I mean, as of the day of retirement, sure. they got to be of age. The same thing is true with FERS. If you want to retire with 30 years of service in the FERS, you have to be, you must have reached your minimum retirement age. Employees say, well, I got all this unused annual leave. Can I use that to make me at my birthday? No, 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 no. Can I, what about my unused sick leave? No, 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 no. You got to be of age as of the, you got to be of age as of, um, the day of your retirement. Gotcha. Gotcha. And our next 30 year has to do with FERS right. and transfers employees. Uh, and that needs to match up with an MRA. So, Ed, you know, I know by the book, if we, if we go to the manual, we see that, that for FERS people, it's between the ages of 55 and 57. Now, realistically, for most of the working FERS folks right now, it's probably fallen between ages 56 and 57, correct? Absolutely, Dan. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So here they are. Uh, they've got 30 years and they're on that MRA. What's that mean to our FERS or FERS transfer? Once again, they've reached their MRA as of the day of retirement. They can retire under an, under an immediate and unreduced retirement. I say unreduced. Their annuity is not going to be reduced. And they will get the first of lifetime FERS annuity checks each month, starting with the first month, uh, I should say the month after they officially retire. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, so our next one coming up is an age only. And it's a little funny because it's not, it's not a birthday. You know, it's, it falls in between. And the, the level of misunderstanding about this, I found to be super high among feds. So let's spend a little time on it, Ed. And that is the milestone age of 59 and a half. So what, is, what does that mean for our feds out there? Okay, age 59 and a half. As you say, Dan, there's no minimum service time here. This is what it comes down to when it comes to age 59 and a half. Um, a, a, an employee, CS Reservers, can make what's called in-service withdrawals from their traditional TSP. Yep. With no early withdrawal penalty. Okay. Now, what that means, what that means is that here, this employee, I mean, still, they're, they're still in federal service. Because they're still in federal service, they can contribute to the traditional TSP. They they're making contributions every 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 pay period, and yet they can take money out of their traditional TSP. Money going in, money coming out at the same gotcha. time with no penalty. Now, of course, traditional TS tr 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 traditional TSP withdrawals are fully federal and state taxable. Okay, you got to keep that in mind. It's going to add to their income. Sure, sure. That's traditional TSP. Roth TSP is a little bit, it's similar, but there are some differences. Roth TSP withdrawals can be made penalty and tax-free, okay, starting at age 59, uh, starting when an employee is 59 and a half, but there's another hurdle here. The other, and, and this involves, um, this involves some, uh, what's called uh, time. Uh, there's a, t a time hurdle here. It has been at least five years since the year that the employee 
made his or her very first Roth TSP contribution. I should say it has to be five years since January 1st of the first year that the employee made his or her um, um, first Roth TSP contribution. So here's an example. Let's say there's an employee out there who is now, let's say, 60 years old. And that employee made um, his first Roth TSP contribution on, um, let's say, July 25th, 2018. That's when they made their very first Roth TSP contribution. Roth TSP, by the way, has been around since, has been around since 2013. Well, let's go to January 1st of that year. That's January 1st, 2018, and go forward five years. That brings us up to January 1st, 2023. We are in the year 2023. That employee is over 59 and a half. Can that employee take money out of their Roth TSP and not pay tax on anything? That includes the earnings, as well as no 10% on withdrawal penalty? The answer is yes, because the employee, the employee um, met those two requirements, at least age 59 and a half, and at least five years since January 1st of the year they made their very first. It only goes back to that very first one, Dan, that first contribution. In this case, on, on July 25th, 2018, that means January 1st, 2018. Gotcha. And these same rules would apply to an outside Roth IRA and outside regular IRA. So we're, we're talking about TSP and Roth TSP here. The, the, but... difference, the difference is though, that with the Roth IRA, that that five-year rule goes back to January 1st of the year the employee or individual made his or her first Roth IRA contributions. Keep in mind, yeah. Dan, the Roth IRA has been around since 1998. Sure. If 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 an employee if an individual made their first Roth IRA contribution, let's say on um, uh, July twenty fifth, two thousand and one, the five year meter starts as of January first, two thousand and one. Sure, absolutely, and and last but not least, around the fifty nine and a half age, that is also a place where a Fed could choose to do an in service transfer from their TSP to their outside uh, traditional IRA, uh, yes. Roth IRA. So they it's just a tremendous amount of flexibility that takes place at 50, 59 and a half. It's almost an emancipation day yes. as far as these, uh, these qualified plans are concerned. So important stuff, folks. Be sure to make note of this and, and make sure you understand it. And if you don't understand it, you know, hit our webinars, hit our website, uh, you know, reach out to us at, at swserve.com. We've got something called a part two where we can help you understand it. But it's important that you know how all these things work so you can make the most of them. So up next is is a big, 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 big number. And and it has to do with, uh, with our CSRS and CSRS offset folks. And that is 41 years and 11 months and that's at any age. So, Ed, tell us what happens for our CSRS and offset folks. There. And, and I got to tell you, I get a lot of questions about this one. A lot of questions from, from CSRS and service offset employees. There are not that many left, but I still I, I still get a lot of questions. So, a CSRS or service offset employee who has a total of a 41 years and 11 months of service, um, if that employee were, were to retire at that point, they would get their starting CSRS annuity would be equal to 80%, which is the, the maximum on the, on the CSRS um, chart, CSRS annuity chart, uh, percentage, I should say, annuity percentage chart, 80%. 80% of their high three average salary, 80%. Yeah. A couple things about that. It's a little misleading. Number one, that 80%, maximum is for years of service it does not include unused sick leave unused sick leave that the employee has at the time of his or her retirement at 41 years 11 months let's say that employee over the years that's a long time 41 years 11 months has sure. about 
two years worth of unused sick leave. Yeah. That would be approximately about 4,100 hours, 4, hours, which is not, you know, that's that's really, really not that far-fetched. I know I retired from federal service. Thank God I'm a healthy person. When I retired from federal service, I had about 32 years. I had about 3,400 hours of unused sick leave. Okay, 3,400 hours. Well, let's say this employee has two years worth of unused sick leave. The way the CSRS annuity is calculated is that after 10 years of service, for every year of service the employee has, including unused sick leave, they get 2% of their high through average salary for every year of service. Mm -hmm. So I was saying that this employee retires at 41 years, 11 months of service, has two years of unused sick leave. They're starting... CS rest annuity would not be 80% of their high fabric salary. It would be 84%. Wow. 84%. Because that two years on sick leave, when converted to months and days of service, you know, two years, um, will add 2% per year for two years, 4% to their annuity. So what I'm saying is there's no cap here, Dan. There's no cap. Gotcha. And then an employee says to me, well, if I, in fact, work beyond 41 years, 11 months of service, I know that I'm getting credit for unused sick leave, but am I, in fact, beyond, you know, am I working for nothing? Won't my annuity go up because I'm continuing to work? And the answer is, it will indirectly go up. Is how so? Well, they're going to still take 7% out of your paycheck if you're CSRS and 0.8% if your service offset. The other 6.2% of your service is going to Social Security. So the person says, well, I repeat my question. Am I working for nothing? I said, no, you're not. Because what's going to happen is once you retire, let's say you work 46 years, 11 months, you, you, could, you put another five years worth of contributions into the CSS Retirement Disability Fund. OPM, once you retire, within 30 days of retirement, is going to send you a letter that we note that you work five years beyond 41 years, 11 months. And that, that additional money that was taken out of your paycheck, 7%, every pay period, SERS, SERS offset, 0.8%. What would you like to do with those, those additional contributions? And they give you two choices, OPM. One, they'll refund those additional contributions in a lump sum payment and give you 3% interest on that lump sum. Or OP, if, if the employee wants this, they, the employee, can ask OPM to put that money, those extra contributions in what is called the CSRS Voluntary Contribution Program, the VCP. Yep. And in so doing, they're eligible to get another annuity in addition to the regular annuity. Certainly don't have time to talk about that, Dan, but I will say this, that on the um, Serving Notice website, I wrote four Fed zone columns yep. on the voluntary contribution program, the VCP. For those employees, CS Rest and Source Offset employees who are interested about this, about what the voluntary contribution program is, please go to www.fed-zone.com and under the search engine, put voluntary contribution program. And those four columns that I wrote will, will pop up. And you'll, you'll learn everything you need to know about the Voluntary Contribution Program. All I can say is, Dan, it is a win-win-win program. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Okay, so our final seven are age only. And the first one you already kind of mentioned was coming. So let's jump in on it, Ed. And that is that age 62 and what happens with that first special retirement supplement. Okay, so when an employee, the first employee again, retires under a regular normal retirement, which includes early retirement, um, uh, and, and they retire before age 62. So what are the possibilities here? A first employee who, let's say, gets an early out, early retirement, a VSA, v, we talked about the, v, the, v, the VRR, the VSIP, they retire before, you know, 62 any age with 25 years of service, age 50 within 20 years of service, employ, a first employee could retire at their MRA 
with a minimum 30 years of service, or they can retire at age 60 with 20 years of service. We are not talking about the MRA plus 10 and the MRA plus 20 immediate retirement. We talked about that on, on, on a previous podcast. Those employees, those first employees who retire under an immediate MRA plus 10, MRA plus 20 are not eligible for the special retirement supplementary. Those first employees who leave federal service and are going to get what's called a deferred annuity are not eligible for the special retirement supplement annuity. Sure. So, so the, the employees, the ones I mentioned who are eligible for it, will get this special retirement supplement annuity in addition to their regular annuity. Don't have time to talk about how it's computed, but all I can say is that the, the employee will get the special retirement annuity starting the month after they retire, but it is stops when they reach age 62. It's It automatically stops at age 62. Gotcha. Gotcha. And our next milestone age is, is a big one. I think everybody just has this date burned into their head as being significant. And I'm not sure they always know why, but that is age 65. So tell us what's going on there. When an individual reaches age 65, federal employees included, um, they become eligible to enroll in Medicare. Medicare. Now there, there are five part, there are four parts to Medicare, I should say. Medicare Part A, the hospital insurance, Medicare Part B, the medical insurance, Medicare Part C, also known as the Medicare Advantage Plans, Medicare Part C, Part C and also Medicare Part D. The prescription drug program. They can enroll in any part of Medicare, uh, parts of Medicare now. If they're eligible for Medicare Part A, it makes them eligible for the other parts as well. Um, and they can enroll in Medicare Part A, Part B, not Part C, not any Part D, as early as age 65. Now, as you know, Dan, we're getting a lot of questions about this baby boomers now are getting to their sure. age now where they're eligible for Medicare. And we, then there are a lot of questions. Should I enroll? Should I, what's the advantage of enrolling in Medicare? You certainly don't have time to talk about it now, but we encourage federal retirees to enroll at least in Medicare part a, which is free and, I, and, and also Medicare part B don't have time to say to talk about it, but I do have something. Once again, Dan, I always, you know, ask it's okay to bring up our monthly webinar mm -hmm. entitled um, the coordination between the federal employee health benefits program, Medicare and TRICARE. TRICARE is the group health insurance program um, um, that, 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 that covers retired members of the uniform services. How these all are all related. How they how how they coordinate, particularly how Medicare fits into both 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 the FEHB and Tricare. It is really important that employees as well as retirees who um, have they, they have a full understanding of what Medicare offers, and we really present all the information on um, our monthly webinar. We have this webinar every month. Again, go to go to Serving Those to Serve website and you'll see it. Just click under web, webinars and the Medicare webinar is there every month. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, we got uh, for our next age, we've kind of got a twofer. Okay, and that is 70 and a half. So it's another one of those funky half birthdays. And I'm going to bet that it's a real small group of people that know about this first one. And that's qualified charitable distributions or QCDs. Tell us about those, Ed. Okay, qualified charitable distributions allow an individual who is at least age 70 and a half to make tax-free withdrawals from their IRAs. I say any traditional IRAs, normally when you take money out of traditional IRAs, you've got to pay tax on the amount that you're taking out, okay? Um, but... If the if that person, the IRA owner, who's again at least seventy and a half, tells the IRA custodian, "Hmm, instead of taking that money out and giving it to me, how about I have this favorite charity, church, synagogue, mosque, the Goodwill? You know, th there's no lack of charitable con uh, organizations out there, Dan. And mm -hmm. the IRA custodian makes a checkout 
from, again, the money's coming from the individual's traditional IRA account. The money will come out tax-free. It's not included in income. Of course, um, the IRA owner is not going to get a charitable a charitable um, contribution deduction on their federal income taxes. They can't, they can't have, they can't have everything. Why are QCDs so, you know, can be very, very useful and, 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 and sometimes very popular mm -hmm. among traditional IRA owners that as we're going to talk about here n next about when you reach 70 and a half, certainly, or, or, or 72 or 73 or 75, we'll talk about why there's a different ages here. Um, you, you, when it comes to owning a traditional IRA, you're subject to what's called required minimum distributions. You have to take out an, um, each year a minimum amount from your IRA in order to avoid what's called an excess accumulation penalty. Well, individuals who were born before July 1st, 1949, your required beginning date, your required beginning date is April 1st, following the year that you turn 70 and a half. So what does QCDs have to, why, why is that important? Because instead of taking RMD, the QCD will take the place of your RMD. It fulfills your RMD requirement. Why is that important? Because as I said a few moments ago, the money coming out of your IRA via a qualified charitable distribution is not included in your income. You don't get a tax deduction, but if you're 70, and a, if you're, you'd say in the case here, you're over 70 and a half and you have other income coming in, like your CSRS or FERS annuity, um, you might have investment income, a tradi a traditional TSP, things like that. You have income coming in. This 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 RMD from your IRA could push possibly push you into a higher tax bracket. It's Ooh, possible. Sure. Also, if you are 70 and a half or older, you also are most likely enrolled in Medicare Part B. You have to mm -hmm. pay a monthly premium for Medicare Part B. Sure. And the higher your income, the larger, larger your your um monthly premium. And vary from it varies from year to year. Well, what's going to be including your income? All the above. Sure. All the above. That is your CSRS annuity, Social Security, uh, T, traditional TSP. All this is included. And maybe you you have a brokerage account. You have capital gains, interest. But if in place of your traditional IRA RMD, you're using this QCD. That may end up pushing you, maybe make you may end up in a lower what's called income tier for Medicare Part B purposes. So QCDs can be extremely useful for people once they reach that required beginning date. Absolutely. Absolutely. And great segue, Ed, because uh, basically your last four, you've, you've touched on one of them right now. Uh, you last four age only things here, 70 and a half, 72, 73, and 75, all have to do with RMDs and the required beginning dates. So let's let's round it out by talking through these. So okay. 70 and a half has been around forever, basically. Uh, yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, Secure Act 1.0, which was passed in December 2019, took effect on January 1st, 2020. There are a lot of things that came out of Secure Act 1.0, but one thing that came out was that Congress decided to raise the required beginning date for certain individuals. And those individuals were the ones born after June the 30th, 1949. If you were born any time after June the 30th, 1949, like myself, I was born in January 1951, your required beginning date, your required beginning date, um, uh, age, I should say age, is 72, 72. So um, if you were born between um, June, if you were born any time after June the 30th, 1949, and you have 
um, a qualified retirement plan like the T- like the TSP 401k plan, traditional IRA, you must make your first RMD no later than April 1st following the year that you turn 72. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, then Secure Act 2.0 was passed. And that was passed in December 2022 with an effective date of January 1st, 2023. Congress raised the required beginning date as follows. It went to age 73. Who does that affect? Anybody born between January 1st, 1951 and December 31st, 1959 has and has an age 73 is your magic age. So you mm-hmm. must take your first RMD no later than April 1st, following the year that you turn 73. Okay. And then finally, anybody born after December 31st, 1959 has age 75 as the magic age. So if you were born anytime after December 31st, 1959, you must take your first RMD no later than April 1st, following the year that you turn 75. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, Brother Ed, we across these two podcasts have covered 33 zero milestones. And, and, Again, folks, I'm willing to bet you didn't know all of these. And maybe some don't apply to you, and that's fine. But they all apply to somebody. So we've got such a great community building out there in our SWS group. You know, there's 600,000 visits a year to the website. So this is a great place for you as a member of that community to not just make a difference for yourself, but make a difference for the other people in your agency, in your office. Okay. Share this podcast. It's a great introduction for them, you know, because Ed and I have a little fun with things. We don't, we try not to go too, too, too deep. So it's, it's excruciating. To listen to, we want this to be entertaining for you, but we also want it to be informative. So hopefully You have found these two to be as helpful as we believe they are. There are definitely, I feel very strongly, that there are definitely some gems and nuggets in here that pretty much every Fed might overlook if it wasn't for something like this. And that's that's our whole purpose. Right, Ed? What's what's your mission? I I agree with you 100%, Dan. I just want to mention that if if, uh, if our listeners, you can spread the word, please. Want to look at that? Co- see the whole column. I give. I'll, I'll, it's in the Fed Zone. It's yep. dated May the fifth, two thousand twenty-three. It's entitled "Important Age and Service Milestones for Fe- for Federal Employees and Retirees." Um, it's there on the website. All you got to do is go to www.fed-zone.com and just you can just under the you know search engine put important age and service milestones and that article yep. will pop up but it is dated may the 5th 2023 absolutely it is it is in there folks and and it's worth grabbing it's worth printing out it's worth taping up somewhere so you know it's there and and none of these things are going to slip by for you uh be sure to uh you know go ahead and bookmark these uh these podcasts download and save this article uh share them with your friends and your agency uh And stay tuned to all of our channels because I'm going to give you a little preview here. We are working on something called Milestone Minder. So we're going to do some of the heavy lifting to help make sure there's an easy way for people to remember these things. So that's that's something that's coming. And this is a big one. This was a big one. And again, I I really want to thank you for everything that you do for the federal community and what you do for us serving as to serve. You truly are a treasure. Thank you. My pleasure. And folks, that is a wrap. Uh, We'll catch you on the next podcast. Uh, Also, if you have been to, if you're at our YouTube channel, 
You will see a couple of new things on there. We've got something called Fed 15. Uh, that's little short snippets of some of the things that you might have missed. And we do our level best to get those in under 15 minutes. Sometimes I run a little bit long because I get a little wordy. But uh, Caitlin Murray is, uh, is, is my partner on that one. And she's doing a great job. So check that out. We are serving as serve. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on our YouTube channel and also on Spotify. Remember to share it with your friends and strangers. Check us out on Twitter and LinkedIn. And don't forget those weekly webinars every single week. That's swserve.com. Uh, click on that webinar button. You'll see the whole menu. The guru will come to you. So wrapping it up for Ed, the crew at Serving the Serve, and for me, Dan Sight, I will end as I always do by saying good luck, Godspeed, and above all, remember, it's your fed life. Make it a great one because you deserve it. Stay well, everybody. We are out. Thank you for listening to the Fed Life Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of serving those who serve or Raymond James. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker or dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services. Raymond James is not affiliated and does not endorse the opinions or services of any of the quoted professionals or their respective firms. Any opinions are those of Dan Sipe and not necessarily those of RJFS or Raymond James. This case study is for illustrative purposes only. Individual cases will vary. Raymond James is not affiliated with and does not endorse the opinions or services of the quoted professionals or their respective organizations. Neither Raymond James Financial Services nor any Raymond James Financial Advisor renders advice on tax issues. These matters should be discussed with the appropriate professional. Investing involves risk and you may incur a profit or loss regardless of strategy selected, including diversification and asset allocation.